Not choose to take the aggressive stance of earlier times, Japanese post-war writers have suggested that the defeat at Midway has had made Yamamoto more cautious, and that was certainly true of the naval staff in Tokyo, which did not urge immediate action. Admiral Turner was seriously worried on September 16th, after learning of the sinking of the Wasp, but no one ever accused him of being faint of heart. He was also spurred by a new sense of urgency. That day, Vander's Cactus Air Force was down to 5,000 gallons of aviation gas, not enough supply for a week of limited operation. It was imperative that Henderson Field be resupplied, and in the absence of any definitive information about the enemy, combined, Fleet Tura decided that any risk must be taken, and he pushed on toward Guadcanal with the reinforcements and the supplies. He was lucky the Japanese submarines were not working the waters northeast of Guadalcanal at the moment, and the Japanese air force at Rabul was kept heavily occupied by B-17 raids, which although they did little damage did manage to keep the busy, while Yamamoto was finishing up with the fueling process in the North Turner, came into Lunga roads at dawn on September 18th. The ships brought the 4,000 fresh troops of the 7th Marine Regiment, plus food tanks, jeeps, field guns and ammunition that day. While the transports unloaded the destroyers, Monson and MCD moved up and down along the shore of Guad Canal, bombarding all known enemy positions, and the damage was not very great, except to Japanese Japanese morale. For days the Japanese on the island had talked of the coming victory, but the Kawaguchi force had failed to take the airfield, and the Japanese airplanes had skipped two days of bombings, and now the American ships seemed to have control of the sea. The Japanese ashore on Guadalcanal suffered an enormous reverse in morale, which was not helped by the fact that in bringing the troops in night after night during the first two weeks of September, the Japanese transports had not brought enough supplies for them, and the existing garrison and food was running short. In the Japanese camps on the American side, the reverse was true, and the Marines were getting three meals a day. Morale had not been higher since the third day of the landing. When the Marines had watched the transports deserting them, the reinforcements were like a shot in the arm, and so were the scores of drums of precious aviation gas. The unit that had suffered more casualties than any of the other Marine unit on Guadcanal was the paratroop battalion, which had been hard hit in the desperate fight for Tulagi, and then had helped the raiders hold on Bloody Ridge, the paratroopers were loaded aboard the transports bound for Numa and arrest all day long. The transports unloaded and loaded, and then at eight o'clock that night they pulled out for Turner knew well that the knights still belonged to the Japanese navy. How right he was, his ships left Lunga roads at eight o'clock that night, and just after after midnight, four Japanese destroyers showed up to bombard the island, and particularly the airfield once again. This gave a little lift to the Japanese morale, but it would also take RE and some basic supplies and more troops to meet the growing American force. But even knowing the state of the American carrier force and of the damage to one American battleship, the Imperial High Command did not make a move in this vital period in September. Even with the 4,000 new troops and a few tanks brought in to replace those destroyed in the Battle of Bloody Ridge, the Marines were in short supply, and short of supplies, it seemed proper they would remain that way until something could be done about the air situation, besides simply replacing the fighters destroyed by attrition. Actually the Japanese were moving into action, and Admiral Yamamoto called more conferences. Admiral Tanaka, who had supervised the piecemeal reinforcement of Guad Canal, spoke up in disgust, and insisted that the, the army must land at least a division if they wanted to recapture the island, and not simply sacrifice Japa Done's lives, his message got through, and Admiral Yamamoto became a believer, and he told the Imperial General Staff that the army must stop thinking in terms of Guadalcanal as a momentary roadblock to the invasion of Papua and the capture of all New Guinea if the Japanese did not destroy the American presence at Guadalcanal. Yamamoto told Tokyo the entire war effort would soon be in jeopardy, the army must divert at least a division from its New Guinea operations, and might have to employ more troops, but it was essential that the struggle for Guadcanal be won or the Papua adventure would most certainly end in failure, as if to underscore the importance of victory Admiral Yamamoto reorganised the striking force of the combined fleet. What Admiral Gormley was worried about was certainly true. The Japanese had an eight, 
one carrier advantage over the Americans, but until this time Yamamoto had not taken the American threats seriously enough to bring most of them down. In late September, he ordered Rear Admiral Kakui Kakuta to come south from Japan, to T.R. Kakuta was the commander of the Second Air Fleet, and his carriers numbered the 27,500-ton Hayo and Juno, and the 13,000-ton Zuo by Japanese standards. These were light carriers, although two of them were as large as the American fleet carriers. These would be added to the 40,000-ton Zuikaku and Shakaku, and give Japan a five-carrier fighting force to add to the battleships and cruisers in the South Pacific. The Americans could not match this strength had Yamamoto made these decisions in August. The battle for Guadalcanal might have ended in Japanese victory by the 1st of October, but because of the intricacies of the Japanese system of divided commands, the response to the United States initiative was extremely slow. The Achilles heel of the Japanese military naval system was this failure to achieve unified command on a theatre basis. One of the real strengths of the American system was its opposite approach. Admiral Nimitz was in command of the South Pacific operations, and Army Army Air Force Marines and Navy were all directly responsible to him. He was responsible to Admiral King, who in TB had to answer to the Joint Chiefs of Staff, which included the senior officers of all services, to be sure, at Guadalcanal, and for the rest of the war in the Pacific, Nimitz struggled with MacArthur for control of operations. But once the control was established by the Joint Chiefs, the Americans operated in general cooperation. As for the Japanese, the cooperation was only at the lowest levels and became truly operative only when the Japanese forces found themselves in desperate circumstances. Guadalcanal was their most serious challenge to date, but desperation had not yet set in, and so army and navy remained aloof from one another, and neither Admiral Yamamoto nor General Huat knew more than vaguely what each other was doing about Guadcanal, late in September, Yamamoto. Was preparing for a new au pair when word came from Imperial General Headquarters in Tokyo that the Guadcanal situation was indeed serious, just as Yamamoto had been saying. Headquarters concluded that it called for temporary abandonment of new moves in Papua, and full attention to the Solomons, also, just as Yamamoto had also been saying, the Imperial Army 2nd Division was ordered from Java to Rabul to prepare to assault Guad Canal in an amphibious landing as early as it could be achieved. Meanwhile, the Japanese did not stop the trickle of reinforcements to Guad Canal. Virtually every night, the destroyers came down the slot, escorting barges or destroyer transports. 500 men landed one night, 600 the next. By the last week in September, the losses of Bloody Ridge had been more than made up by the Japanese forces, and their headquarters area west of the Matano sector had received new guns and ammunition. The food supply was still not keeping up with the size of the force, and that was the major problem in the air the last two weeks of September, except for the last two days, were quiet. The rainy season was at its height, and heavy cloud cover interdicted Japanese attacks against Henderson Field. The Marine and Navy dive bombers took off daily for missions against the Japanese ships coming down the slot, but they also were hampered so badly by weather that in this period they were ineffective on September 21st. Admiral McCain was relieved of command of the South Pacific Air Forces by Admiral Fitch and started back to Washington McCain, was a victim of Admiral King's prejudices, and was saved from being sent out to pasture only by Nimitz's and Turner's vigorous defence. Even so, King could not forget that the disaster of Savu Island was caused largely by air search failure, and no matter the reason McCain was the man responsible for the next two years, he would fly a desk as chief of the Bureau of Aeronautics in Washington. Although it was a personal tragedy, it was fortunate for the aviators in the field to have in Washington a friend of the fighting men, a man who was more concerned with getting aircraft to the scenes of operations than in shuffling papers after McCain was relieved, and had started homeward. Admiral Nimitz flew to Palmyra on September 24th to meet McCain and question him about the air situation in the South Pacific. Actually, Nimitz wanted much more information than that the Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Ocean Areas and the Pacific Fleet was on his way to Numa to find out what was wrong with the Guad Canal operations that was making it so costly and so ineffectual, an indication of the desperation with which Nimitz considered the air problems in Guadalcanal, was his inquiry to McCain regard 
in possible use of the New Zealand Air Force to be integrated into the American force. There, Nimitz did not have planes for the New Zealand pilots. McCain told him the services were so different in discipline and outlook that it would never work. McCain told Nimitz the number one problem in the South Pacific was aircraft. Not, not pilots, actually, at that moment. The Cactus Air Force needed pilots. But no one outside, not even McCain, understood the severity of the combat fatigue suffered by virtually every man after these six weeks. But McCain did know that planes, parts and aviation gas had to be on hand and constantly siphoned in to Guadcanal. If the island was to be held in his own leathery way, the wizened McCain got across to Nimitz the need to replace Fletcher, and not just on a few weeks' temporary duty two or three of these fights are enough for any one man, a rest will do him good, said the Air Admiral. One of the big problems in the South Pacific had been the relative ineffectiveness of the B-17 bombers that were so successful in Europe, the Japanese Navy had real contempt for the B-7S, and they never hit anything, said one Japanese officer when his ship was under B-7 attack. And while that was not strictly true, the big plan's bombing results were minimal. At this stage of the Pacific War, General Millard Harmon, commander of the South Pacific Army Air Force, was trying to work out a new method to better the B-7S bombing the Navy would have liked to see the B-7S abandoned for other planes. But Harmon said that the Army Air Force had too much invested in the B-17 and simply had to make it work in the Pacific as well as the Atlantic. His current thinking was to bring them down low to bomb, and at low altitudes their size as a target could po pass a danger, but that hazard could be reduced by adopting weaving tactics, much like ships zigzagging, until almost on target McCain had developed a considerable respect for the B-17, but not for the way they were employed. He had seen pictures taken at Rata Bay, where the big planes had caught five seaplanes on the water near their tender. The B-7S came in low and strafed. They destroyed the five sea planes, and one of them attacked the tender clear, clearing its decks. The bomber was in turn riddled by low-level Japanese anti-aircraft fire, but one of the great virtues of the B-17, like the F-4F, was its tough hide, with twenty or thirty holes as big as saucers, that one B-17 flew back to its base, and Admiral McCain headed for San Diego when he got there. He talked to Fletcher, as Nimitz had asked him to, and when he reached Washington he reported back to Nimitz that Fletcher had best have a long rest. Afterwards, McCain could report that Fletcher had virtually said so himself, and McCain also said he had talked to Admiral King on the telephone and asked for fifty high-altitude fighters to be sent to Guadcanal right away. That was when King began shouting a habit for which he was famous in Maine Navy, the rickety temporary building put up in World War I for an expanding navy, which was still headquarters in 1942. Nimitz headed south toward Numa, knowing that in McCain he had an ally going to Washington who would try to get every plane possible for the Pacific, and the Fletcher matter had been handled easily. Admiral William Holley had shown up back at Pearl Harbor a few days before Hale and Harty, after three months in the hospital, itching to get into action. And Nimitz knew very well that with High in charge of the carrier force in the South Pacific, there would be no need to wonder if his carrier commander was willing to fight. He had not asked McCain about Gurley, that would have been most unseemly since Gurley was the area commander, but as Nimitz went. A string saver had brought along a National Geographic map of the South Pacific, and Captain Ralph Ophi Nimitz's air officer used it as a nutternal aid to bring the B-17 into Henderson Field, Nimitz visited with General Vandergrift, who told him his true bobble but never gave any sign of quitting. He awarded medals and managed to get up to the marine lines and see for himself what his men were up against. On October 2nd he was back in Numa for one more meeting with Admiral Gourley. At that meeting Nimitz urged Gurmley to take a more aggressive stance, he gave him specific instructions, and then he left Numa for Pearl Harbour, and he had some heavy thinking to do back at Pearl Harbour. Admiral Nimitz sent messages to Admiral Gormley, insisting that Gormley put the fleet at risk, which meant that Gormley was to stop pussyfooting and fight. The Washington was the only battleship in the South Pacific then, and Gormley had sent it out of harm's way. Nimitz said that Task Force 16 must be brought up close to Cape Esperance, to protect the transports from Japanese attack. 
Nimitz also wanted the carrier task force, even though it was reduced to one carrier to be brought up where it could fight. Even when Nitz had been on Guadcanal, the respite of the closing days of September had begun to end on the island the Marines encountered Japanese patrols that were obviously probing for information about the American dispositions. On September 30th, the Betty bombers were back. The Japanese in Tokyo had begun to pour aircraft into the pipeline for the Navy forces at Rabul, despite Army opposition to any cutback even temporary in their supply of aircraft, which never seemed to get into action. Still, every night, the Japanese destroyer transports and barges landed supplies, and men the SBDs bombed them, and the puns strafed trucks and troops moving along the new roads the Japanese had built. It was apparent to the pilots that Japanese ground activity had increased in the previous week, on October 2nd. The coast watchers were caught unaware, and before anyone knew it, nine bombers and 36 Zeros swept in from the west. The gong rang at Henderson Field, and the American fighter pilots scrambled, but the Japanese fighters caught them from above as they were gaining altitude and shot down six of them, while the Americans shot down four Zer. At the end of the day, General Giga had only 26 operational fighters, and the Japanese at that point had nearly 100 Zeros at Rabul. The Japanese demonstrated their fighter strength on October 3rd, when the usual noon bombing raid was escorted by 27 Zeros, but the quality of the pilots was also showing. On this day the Americans had warning, and they climbed high long before they saw the Japanese, then swooped down on them in the approved diving passes. They shot down nine Zosa visiting pilots, Colonel Joseph Bauer shot down four of them, and then two more Zeros made the mistake of zooming low across Henderson Field to strafe. Both were shot down by the anti-aircraft gunners. At the end of this day, the picture looked better. Two American planes were lost, but no pilots back at Rabul, the enormous loss of 10% of the fighter. Force caused consternation. Admiral Yamamoto from TRU relieved Admiral Tahara as commander of the 11th Air Fleet and in installed Vice Admiral Janichi Kusaka in that post at True, there was at long last a growing feeling of urgency about Guadalcanal. The nightly resupply from Shortland Island was increased, and Admiral Tanaka carried out the mission day after day, although his grumbling about piecemeal reinforcement was heard clearly at truck on the ground at Guadcanal. Action was confined to patrols on both sides, but the size and activity increased in the air and on the sea. However, it was a different struggle, and on the afternoon of October 3rd, the SBD air searchers found three destroyers speeding toward Guadcanal, something they had not seen for many weeks, then another group sighted an enemy seaplane tender north of the island, escorted by six destroyers back at Henderson Field. The bombers were put in the air, and they attacked the seaplane tender Nishin at dusk, but the Japanese anti-aircraft gunners were good. They put up such heavy fire that the bombers missed their target by midnight. The Japanese force was at Cape Esperon, and beginning to unload its supplies of tanks, 150 mm howitzers, guns, men and food. The Cactus Air Force launched another attack just before midnight, but since the night was dark and they didn't make contact with the enemy until late their bombs missed during the last week of September, General Vandergrift planned a move to envelop the Japanese west of the Matano River on September 23rd. Lieutenant Colonel Chesty Puller took his first battalion of the fresh STH Marines on an expedition that was to move six miles southwest of Henderson Field. The Vandergrift staff was operating on the principle that the Japanese had been badly mauled ten days earlier and would be in no condition to mount a strong defence. But they failed to count on the effectiveness of the nightly resupply programme and the high standard of combat readiness of the Japanese reinforcements, all of whom were veterans of previous military action. Colonel Puller's battalion was supposed to cross the Matano River but failed, and on the night of September 26, reached the mouth of the river, the 1st Raider Battalion had gone upstream that day to cross and join Pula. The 2nd Battalion of the 5th Marines was already at the mouth of the Matano as reserve. The Raiders made a long march, but the Japanese were waiting for them at Topper Hill near the bridge where the Americans intended to cross, and they ambushed the force, Lieutenant Colonel S.B. Griffith, the new commander of the 1st Raiders, Red Mike Edson, had been promoted to command. The 5th Marines was wounded in the fierce struggle for that hill, 
and Major Kenneth Bailey was killed, as were a number of Marines. The raiders retreated to the mouth of the Matano, and three companies of the Pula Battalion crossed the river the next day by landing boat, landed between two Japanese positions, and were promptly ambushed by by the enemy who got between them and the beach surrounded. They suffered many casualties, and called for help by spelling out the word with clothing on. A grassy meadow, a plain from Henderson Field, spotted the help sign, and reported by radio to General Vandergrift's headquarters, Colonel Puller then took passage on the seaplane tender Monson, and found them not far from the beach by hand, Samar 4. The ship signalled that the Marines should move down the coast, while the Monson covered their retreat with its guns, under constant fire from Japanese machine guns, mortars and field pieces. Seamen from the Monson brought the Marines off the beach in landing boats. Finally, the Marines had to call Henderson Field for air support to aid the retreat, and by the end of September 28th, they were back where they had started having suffered 60 killed and more than 100 men wounded. At least they had learned that the Japanese had been strongly reinforced, as for General Huat, he still underestimated the Americans. He believed there might be as many as 7,500 United States troops on Guadcanal when there were more nearly 20,000. But in order to make fast work of the Americans, the army had decided to use real force and sent in another 15,000 man division, bringing the Japanese force on the island up to about 25,000 men. From the Japanese point of view, the operations of late September and early October were simply holding in actions while they brought in troops from China, Java and the Philippines to assist in the South Pacific operations. The army had never lost sight of its intention to move in strength against New Guinea, and most of one division would be retained at Rabul to be used for that purpose as soon as the troublesome gnats were removed from Guadcanal. Meanwhile, the troops were moving in from the shortlands, and the major offensive was a few days away while Admiral Nimitz had been in Newa. He had authorised Gormley to use any troops he could get to help at Guadcanal, and from General MacArthur came word that he would send immediately the 164th Regiment of the American Division, a National Guard unit, the additional 3,000 troops would help so that plan was in the works, and Admiral Gawley made arrangements to send them down by transports protected by the best force he could muster. There was an increased confidence now too, because in recent weeks the Japanese had been given a thorough working over on the sea anywhere within 250 miles of Guadcanal, that they happened to appear during the daylight hours, the force of bombers in the Matha command had grown much larger, and the bombing had become effective enough that the Japanese could no longer sneer at the B-7S. On October 4th, Admiral Yamamoto was ready to move, and that day he issued his operational orders for the invasion, a naval and air attack that would drive the Americans off Guadalcanal. General Huake would go to Guadcanal personally to take over from General Kawaguchi, who had failed to do the job, the general would be accompanied by 22,500 troops of the 2nd Army Division, all of them veterans of Asian action. The first target would be Henderson Field, and after that was taken, the American troops would be fought, defeated and captured until General Vander surrendered. The Japanese had planned it all. Vander RFT's surrender would come on October 15th. First, the air attacks by the 11th Air Fleet would be increased even above the high level of the past week. The battleships Congo and Haruna would come to Guadcanal to bombard the American beachhead and Admiral Kondo's second fleet would operate north of Guadalcanal with three carriers, while Admiral Nagumo's third fleet would operate east of the islands with the Shakaku and Zuikaku. The cruiser and destroyer resources of the combined fleet would be available to take whatever action seemed called for. Lieutenant General Mariyama and General Huake were landed with the troops by the Tokyo Express. The increased Japanese activity was a signal to General Vandergrift that a major offensive was coming, so he deployed six marine battalions to secure control of the Matanikau River, but the Americans and the Japanese had the same idea simultaneously, and on October 8th, Vandergrift's marines ran into elements of the Japanese 4th Infantry Regiment and flushed them out, marching up the Matano to the crossing point called Nippon Bridge. On October 9th, the American troops crossed and marched back down the opposite side of the river. Colonel Puller's battalion trapped a thousand of the troops of the 4th Infantry Regiment in two ravines, 
and when marine artillery began firing OJ the Japanese, they tried to escape up the sides of the ravines and ran into marine machine gun fire in the battle that day. 700 Japanese soldiers died, and the marines returned to their lines with casualties of about 200 killed and wounded. The Matano area seemed secure, and on October 8th, the Japanese SE plane tender Nishin made another trip to Guadcanal and successfully landed heavy guns, tanks and supplies for the 2nd Division on October 10th, Admiral Kaka's task force steamed out of True with the three carriers to support the Guadcanal recapture, and that night the last of the 2nd Division was landed at Guadcanal, bringing almost to a par the numbers of American and Japanese troops on the island. Although neither side knew it, one reason that Admiral Yamamoto had delayed the combined operation was to secure a new airbase at Buan in southern Banville, as Yamamoto knew one major reason for the high Japanese losses in the air battles of the last two months had been the inordinate distance the Japanese planes had to fly to reach the Americans. If a plane was damaged, its chances of making the 500M return journey to Rabal were not good. But with the new fighter bases halfway between Rabal and Guadcanal, a much more effective air cover and attack would be possible from Buan. Constant air cover of Japanese operations could be managed on a daily basis. The fighter strip was finished on October 8th, and the 11th Air Fleet sent down 30 planes, a combination of zeros and ramps, the carrier version of the zero from October 5th. Then the increase in activity at Guadcanal had been enormous, with the Japanese sending hundreds of planes to Guadalcanal, the Marines fighting them off the Japanese landing forces by night, and the Marines trying not very successfully to interdict Admiral Turner sailed from Numa with the 3,000 troops of the American division in his flagship Macaulay. With the transport Zeitlin and eight escorts, their destination was Lear Roads, and their schedule called for them to pass north of San Cristal Island through Lango Channel to arrive at the roads on the morning of October 13th to protect them. Admiral Turner called on three task forces, the Hornets Force, 180 miles southwest of Guadcanal, the Washington, and her lesser ships, 50 miles east of M and Admiral Norman Scott's cruiser force near Rhinel Island. Scott in particular was to keep his eye on Cape Esperance, and if any enemy ships showed up, he was to attack them. Scott was travelling in the cruiser San Francisco, and had with him the heavy cruiser Salt Lake City, and the light cruisers, Helena and Boise and the destroyers Buchanan, Duncan Laffey Farenholt and McCalla, the attacks mounted by General Gear's Cactus Air Force on October 9th and 10, were more than vexing to Admiral Mawa, and he asked Admiral Kusaka to do something drastic with the 11th Air Fleet to stop the Americans on October 10th. That demand was repeated after 42 American planes attacked the Japanese ships returning from the nightly Tokyo Express run. Not much damage was suffered by the Japanese ships, a few near misses and a few casualties, but Maie's exasperation was nearly complete. Since the 11th Air Fleet had failed Kedhim, he sent down a task force under the command of Admiral Aritomo Gu to take care of Henderson Field, and he hoped to provide sufficient cover so that the night convoy would not be disturbed. The heavy cruisers Alba Kinugasa and Furutaka and the destroyers Hatsuyuki and Fubuki were to do the job. This was the night scheduled for delivery to Guadcanal of the last and largest part of the 2nd Division, for once the American air intelligence system was working better than the Japanese Admiral Mawa was totally unaware of the American cruiser force lurking off Cape Esperant. Admiral Scott knew of the presence destination course and speed of the two Japanese forces, the reinforcements and the covering warships by six o'clock that evening. Scott knew that the enemy was less than 100 miles from Savo Island, and he sped 29 knots to catch them. The Americans were ready for action this time. As they sped toward Guadcanal, the ships came to Sishan battle stations and made ready for the call general quarters that would signal the fight. The Americans came around the western coast of Guadcanal, and Scott launched two of his four float planes. The other two were lost due to operational mishap, but the two that did get into the air headed out to find the enemy at 10.30 a.m. that night. Scott's ships were 14 miles off Cape Esperon, moving towards Sao to intercept the Japanese Admiral Gu had warning when one of the Salt Lake City's float planes was launched. Somehow the flares she was carrying caught fire and the plane burned on top of the water. 
the flames were visible 50 miles away where Admiral GTO's cruisers and destroyers were moving down, but when a lookout called attention to the flame, the Admiral and his staff decided it must be a signal from the Japanese troops on the beach. He replied with signal blinkers, but did not really suspect a problem. Even when there was no answer, the Japanese were still suffering from an enormous sense of superiority, which seemed quite justified for so far on the sea, except for Midway, which was an aerial fight they had proved themselves far superior to the Americans. Just before 11 o'clock that night, the Salt Lake City's observation plane reported three ships six miles from Savo Island. That was about the end of the usefulness of the float planes one had engine trouble and had to land and the other found nothing. Admiral Scott kept cruising between Savo Island and Cape Esperance waiting, and the American force became thoroughly confused. The Helena's radar found a target at 11.08 a.m., but the San Francisco's radar did not pick it up. Scott continued to manoeuvre unaware. Of the closeness of the enemy at 11.32 a.m., the column turned about, and ten minutes later the captain of the Helena announced that he had a target six mil away heading northwest. Then the Boise delivered a strange report speaking of bogies, which usually meant aircraft. Although her captain was speaking of unidentified ships, the destroyers followed Admiral Scott's manoeuvres and came up alongside, except for the Duncan, whose captain got the impression that the other destroyers had seen the enemy as he had, and were attacking the Duncan, staged a lone attack at 30 knots straight at the radar contacts. So the Duncan was going one way, and the rest of the task force another at 11.45am. The American communications got fouled up, so that no one seemed to know what anyone else was doing. But at 11.46am, the Helena opened fire on the radar contacts. None of the Americans knew it. But unwittingly, they had crossed the T of the Japanese force, crossing the TE is a naval term as old as warfare, and it refers to the use of a ship's guns when a warship is running south, as the Japanese ships were its guns trained. Straight ahead only the forward guns can be brought to bear on the target. The ideal position for firing is at right angles to the target, and on the night of October 11th Admiral Gu's ships were moving in a column, and suddenly Admiral Scott's ships crossed the T. Ideally the United States ships would have stayed in line, which meant every American vessel could bring all its guns to bear on the various Japanese ships, while if the Japanese vessels in the rear fired forward, they might hit one of their own ships. The American position was ideal. Actually, Admiral Scott achieved it without even knowing it at the time, or until the battle was reconstructed much later. And in fact, the crossing of the T lasted only a brief time, since the various ships began to manoeuvre independently a development that would have made Lord Nelson spin in his coffin in St Paul's Church in London, the Helena's first few shots began to hit the Japanese, and the Salt Lake City found an enemy cruiser on her starboard bow and began firing. The Ioba was hit and the Furutaka was hit, but they began firing back and got a hit on the Salt Lake City that killed a few men. Soon all the American ships were firing on the Japanese. Even the destroyers took on the cruisers, the Lafey fired at the AER, and the Duncan had steamed full speed ahead into the enemy, and now found herself less than a mile away with enemy ships closing on both sides of her lieutenant commander, E.B. Taylor, captain of the destroyer, tried to get his torpedoes into play, but as he turned, a Japanese shell hit in the number one fire room. Almost immediately, other shells began striking the ship. Eshish, the Duncan, did manage to fire two torpedoes, but then several shells struck vital parts of the ship, and the next few minutes were marked by a comedy of errors. Admiral Scott decided that his cruisers were firing on American destroyers and ordered a ceasefire at the same time Admiral Gu came to the same conclusion that he had mistakenly engaged his own supply force carrying the troops to Guad Canal, so he stopped firing. But even as he gave the order, a shell from one of the American cruisers came in and dealt Admiral Gu a mortal wound. Admiral Scott spent the next few minutes trying to find out what was going on. He asked his destroyer commander if he had been shooting at the destroyers. No, said the commander, four minutes passed, however, before Scott ordered his ships to resume fire. He was lucky, because most of the gunners had not paid any attention to his orders, and the firing was still going thick and fast. The Ioba and the Furutaka were burning, and the Ioba made A80 degrees turn to the right, and headed straight into the American gunfire. 
She was followed by the Furutaka and the Kinugasa turned the wrong way by mistake and managed to get out of range and was followed by the destroyer Hatsuyuki. The Duncan was in bad shape and the United States destroyer Fahrenholt was also taking many shells. Unfortunately, most of the shells that hit her as well as the Duncan were American. The San Francisco spotted the destroyer Fubuki less than a mile away and opened fire. Her action was followed by the other cruisers, and in five minutes the Fubuki stopped, exploded, and sank at 11.55 a.m. Admiral Scott became convinced that he was really fighting the enemy, and he looked around, then swung his column of ships to parallel the Japanese. The Japanese and American ships moved side by side, shooting at each other at midnight. Admiral Scott again ordered his ships to cease firing, but nobody seemed to pay much attention until he ordered all ships to flash recognition lights and assume a column formation, Fahrenholt, and Duncan could not, but the others did, and they began to chase the Japanese and the Japanese fought back. The Kinugasa began firing at the American flagship, but the shells straddled her wake. She sent torpedoes at the Boise, but the American lookout spotted them, and the ship turned hard right and the torpedoes sped away and the Ioba got in several hits on the Boise, which began to bum. The Salt Lake City moved up to protect the Boise, and she fired rapidly at the Japanese cruisers, and took their attention away from the stricken American ship, and the Boise was in serious trouble. Fires approached her magazines, and the captain ordered them flooded, but all the men at the flood control panel had been killed. She might have gone up in one great blast, except that an enemy shell ripped into her hull and flooded the magazines with seawater, stopping the fire and saving the ship. Half an hour after midnight the battle was over, and the destroyer Fahrenholt had a bad list, but she was able to move at twenty knots and started back to near. The Duncan was in dreadful shape and her bridge was askew, and most of the control units there were demolished forward. The ship was burning and the metal was red hot, Communications were destroyed so that the captain could not communicate with the after part of the ship, and he finally took the men off the bridge section. Many men were still aboard as the ship steamed in circles at fifteen knots. Some of them, led by Lieutenant Herbert R. Cabat, tried to beach the ship, but there was no way to control her, and at two o'clock in the morning it was apparent that she was about to go, ammunition was exploding and flames covered the whole hull and those alive abandoned ship in the water, they were beset by sharks and rescuers from the Ma'ala, had to drive the man-eaters off with rifle fire. But in the end, 80% of the 250 members of the crew was saved. The hulk floated until nearly noon the next day, when she sank to join the dozens of other ships and smaller craft that paved the bottom of Iron Bottom Sound, off toward the slot. The Hatsuyuki stood by and took the survivors off Furutaka when it became certain she could not be saved. As dawn came up the AA retired she had been hit more than thirty times, but she still sped along at highest speed because the captain feared an American air attack. As dawn arrived she left behind the Fubuki, which sank, but the destroyers Shirayuki and Morumo returned to rescue survivors and picked up four hundred men from the Furutaka and the Fubuki. As this battle was waged, Admiral Osima, commander of the Japanese reinforcement force, landed his men and 150 mm guns and stores near Kokumbona on Guadalcanal, and then turned around, there were still many Japanese in the water, and the Americans tried to rescue them. Some refused, but about 110 Japanese sailors were pulled from the water to become prisoners of war. When the night battle ended, the American ships requested Gurmley to send air cover at dawn, and the Japanese ships headed back to Shortland Island at 5.15am the next morning, 16 bombers and an escort of F-4Fs and some P-39SS that had just flown in to help the Cactus Air Force strength took off from Henderson Field, looking for any Japanese ships that might have been crippled. It was a serious setback to Admiral Yamamoto's Plan X. On October 9th, Yamamoto had sent staff officers from the flagship Yamato to Rabaul to give the orders to the 11th Air Fleet, the 8th Fleet, and to the Army, and to answer any questions Plan X had provided for the combined operations to retake Guad Canal, and, and on October 12th the Army would begin shelling the airfield, and so would naval vessels coming in offshore on October 13th.
the shelling would be increased dramatically by both Army and Navy on the 14th. Six high-speed transports would arrive at Guadcanal Anchor and begin unloading supplies, and the last men of the Army Reinforcement Group on October 15th at 11 o'clock, the transport would finish unloading and move back up Sea Channel to the shortlands. At noon, the Japanese Army would, would begin the operation that would overrun the airfield and force the Americans to surrender during all this operation. The 11th Air Fleet and all other aviation organisations would make a maximum effort to strike Henderson Field and keep the American aircraft from operating, so Admiral Cato's carelessness had put a monkey wrench in the plan, although in spite of the disgrace of the Cape Esperant defeat, the Japanese Navy had not really suffered much in that engagement, and for the next few days the Japanese reaped an unexpected harvest. From it, the damage to two American cruisers and one destroyer meant that that force had to move back to base, leaving Cape Esperant unguarded. The Japanese Navy then was free to continue the build-up for the major battle. It was planning the 2nd and 3rd Japanese fleets had left Tro on October 11th to move north and east of the Solomons. The 11th Air Fleet at Rabal was ordered to make a maximum effort to destroy the United States air umbrella that covered the slot in the daytime, and this meant knocking out the plains of Henderson Field on October 12th because of the Cape Esperant defeat Admiral Yamamoto officially postponed X day but the operation of the fleet air arm and the supply organisation continued the same. Admiral Kusaka took his assignment seriously. By this time, the Japanese were well aware of the effectiveness of the Allied Coast Watching Network. They had tried unsuccessfully to root it out on the ground, but the Australians had built up goodwill with the islanders, who would usually protect or warn them against Japanese land searches. But Kusaka had another means of avoiding raising the alarm on October 13th, he sent the planes on a wide route at high altitude, and when the 27 Betty bombers and 18 Zero fighters came in at noon at 30,000 feet above Henderson Field, General Gurr had only a few minutes to put up 42 F4FS, but they were still climbing to reach the bomber level when the bombs began to fall. The bombing was very accurate, putting 13 craters in the runway and destroying much of the Mar Mat that was so hard to keep in place, only this metal matting made the runway usable on wet days by the dive bombers and torpedo bombers. The bombs also burned a 5,000 G fuel dump as the bombers sped away one F4F shot down the leader, but was riddled in return, and the pilot Lieutenant William Freeman had to ditch the battered plane, and another pilot shot down a zir the Marines were refueling the fighters working over the M and matting and moving drums of aviation fuel out of the disaster area. When the second raid of the day arrived, 18 twin-engine bombers and 18 Zeros Captain Joe Foss and the members of Marine Fighter Squadron 121 had just arrived at Henderson Field four days earlier, but they had learned much in those last 96 hours. Operations managed to get a dozen F-4Fs in the air, and Foss led them out, shot down one Z, and was nearly shot down by three others before he landed at such speed that an ambulance chased him down the fighter strip. The dozen fighters scarcely hindered the Japanese bombers. This raid did more damage and destroyed several aircraft. The pilots agreed that it was the most aggressive and damaging series of. Raids during all the days they had been at Henderson just after dark, a single twin-engine bomber flew across the island, and the anti-aircraft guns pounded, and the Marines' searchlights stabbed the sky to find it, but the plane completed its mission and flew away. But no one knew what the mission was. An hour later, the newly unloaded Japanese 150mm howitzer mortars began to shell Henderson Field and its environs, the destroyers. Stetgwin and Nicholas were dispatched from the area where Admiral Turner was unloading troops and supplies to the area west of the Matano, and they bombarded what they thought was the firing zone. Soon the howitzers were silent while these events occurred in the darkness of Guadcanal. Two Japanese battleships were coming down the slot. Their target was Henderson Field, and they were instructed to bombard it thoroughly to destroy the American fighters and bombers there. Vice Admiral Tako Korita was in direct charge of the operation. He had nearly 1,000 shells for the 14 in guns of the Congo and the Haruna. As the ships neared the island, Kurita sent aloft one of his float observation planes just before midnight of October 13th. 
The Marines heard the familiar washing machine Charlie as the plane flew over the airfield and iron bottom sound, looking to see that no surprises were lying in wait at one o'clock on October 14th. The eight big guns of Congo and the eight big guns of Haruna began to fire in a continual roar. The float plane dropped a flare that lighted up the airfield, and observers in the plane and in the mountains gave coordinates to correct the battleship's fire. No part of the airfield was to be untouched this night. Admiral Karita vowed the shells started fires in the fuel dumps, and blasted one plane after another in the revetments which were not well hidden. Marines crouched in the slit trenches and tried to duck down even lower in the next hour and a half. The battleships threw 918 shells at Henderson Field with this bombardment raging. There was no chance that an aircraft could safely take off and get into the air along the shore Marine Navy searchlights tried to find the Japanese ships, but the ships were a mile offshore and the lights and the gunfire from Guadalcanal were totally ineffective. Four PT boats had recently been brought to Tulagi to assist in the defence against the Tokyo Express, and these went out to fight. They scurried about the fringes of the battleship's destroyer screen-firing machine guns and torpedoes, and although they did not score any hits, the Japanese destroyers were forced to fire back. These also caused Admiral Kurita some concern, but it was only when he had exhausted his allocated ammunition that Kurita finally ended the bombardment at 2.30am on the morning of October 14th, and retired to the north when dawn came and the Marines began to count the cost of the bombardment. They found that only 42 planes remained intact, of a total of 90 on the field the previous day. Most of the aviation gas had been destroyed, and 41 men had been killed, and 100 wounded that morning. The 150mm howitzers kept the men at the airfield off balance, and then at noon once again, without warning, Japanese bombers arrived and attacked the airfield again. At the end of this raid, General Geyer announced that the bomber airstrip with the M and matting was out of service until further notice. All planes would have to use the cow pasture that had been used only for the fighters the fires at Henderson Field burned all the next day, and the Japanese troops on the island gained an enormous boost in morale. They had messages from Yamamoto and 17th Army Headquarters to expect more reinforcements and a strong attack on the Americans that next night. The Americans had the same sort of dispatches Admiral Gormley estimated that six Japanese transports supported by cruisers and destroyers would land thousands of troops on Guadcanal. That night, the combined fleet's carriers had been reported 250 miles north of M, unfortunately. The American carrier force was north of New Colonia and could not arrive in the area before October 15th, and the cruiser force was at Espiritus Santo and could not arrive until the 16th, as Admiral Yamamoto had expected the combination of air raids and bombardment had destroyed the ability of the Cactus Air Force to control the waters around the island. Before the Battle of Cape Esperons, the Japanese had been unable to bring ships down the slot in the daylight hours, but on October 14th they had no such fear. Six transports, escorted by destroyers and covered in the air by large flights of Zeros, moved down the slot unopposed of the 39 dive bombers that had been on the field on October 13th. Four dive bombers, three P-400S and four P-39, were all that were left. All the torpedo bombers had been destroyed at 9.30am on the morning of October 14th. The alarm rang and the fighter planes scrambled. Admiral Kurita's air intelligence had failed in one respect. The little fighter strip had gone unnoticed by the observers, and so of the 42 F-4Fs on the ground on the night of October 13th, 29, remained operational. The alarm the next morning came from the coast watchers, but when the fighters got into the air they found nothing, and they came down almost immediately to save precious fuel again. The search for every quart of aviation gas on the island was pursued, and what could be found was poured into the fighter tanks they were still on. Though the ground, when the usual noon raid arrived, 26, Betty bombers attacked the main airstrip, tearing more holes, but again they did not seem to see the cow pasture 100 yards away, and the fighters went unnoticed. The leader of this first raid announced to Rabaul that American air strength on Guadcanal had been completely destroyed, and so when the next raid of 18 bombers came in an hour later, they were careless. The F-4Fs were alerted and waiting in the sky above them, 
they claimed N-9 bombers and three Zero fighters. The bombers that escaped did not drop their loads successfully. The raid was a failure. The search planes in the waters north of Guad Canal found the transports heading fast down the slot, and they also spotted Admiral Ma's 8th Fleet, the cruisers Kinugasa and Chokai, with two destroyers without a force of bombers. There was nothing the Americans could do about it. Undoubtedly, the afternoon of October 14th was the low point of the defence of Gu Canal. Colonel Toby Munn General Gear's aide drove around the airfield to the bomber and army pilots' quarters and warned them that the situation was desperate. The Japanese were sending troop reinforcements and warships to pound the airfield again. If they sent enough troops and did enough damage to the airfield, the Marines might not be able to hold. They had gasoline enough for only one more mission for all the planes they were to load up the SBDs and the P-400S with bombs and attack the Japanese ships that would probably be the last mission. Then the aviators would have to join the ground troops in defence of the perimeter. The bombers and the army planes were patched up that day by mechanics who worked under shelling. From the Japanese 150mm howitzers on the other side of the island, the mechanics cannibalised one plane after another and drained the gas out of two wrecked B-7S from other wrecked planes, and from the slender store of remaining drums, they got enough fuel at 2.45am for bombers, and the seven army planes took off. They bombed the transport group and did some damage to the destroyer Samidaire, but scarcely enough even to slow her down. They were driven off by the umbrella of zeros, and by four o'clock in the afternoon, the cannibal mechanics had managed to put together nine more bombers accompanied by the army planes. And fighters, they attacked the transports, but were again driven away by the large force of zeros, and one of the army planes was shot down. They came back in the dark, and one more army plane crashed on landing, and that was the end of air operations for the day, as darkness. Covered Guad Canal, General Vandergrift faced the stark future. The Japanese would land six transports full of troops and supplies, and as matters stood, there was no way he could do anything to stop them. He sent a message whose very bleakness told the story urgently necessary that this force receive maximum support of air and surface units at Espiritu. Santo Admiral Fitch received that message and looked over the previous files to add up the difficulties of the Cactus Air Force. He had on hand eight bombers from the Enterprise Air Group and nine spare bombers, but no pilots to fly them. He solved the problem by ordering fighter pilots of Marine Fighting 212 to ferry, the bombers to Guad Canal come back by transport plane and be prepared to move their fighter planes too to Guad Canal. At a moment's notice, aviation gasoline was on it its way to Guad Canal by barges that had been shipped from Espiritu Santo on October 10th, each towed by a tug and accompanied by two cargo ships and two destroyers. But in view of the Japanese control of the sea around Guad Canal at 1.30am on the morning of October 14th, the commander of the force had told Gurmley the danger was too great to continue the journey. Instead, he suggested sending the barges on with the destroyers Viro and Meredith and the old destroyer seaplane tender McFarland, loaded with drums of aviation gas. Fitch accepted that and also arranged for an airlift to for drums of fuel by transport plane from Espiritus Santo, starting the next day. So as the night wore on, the wheels were beginning to move, but on Guad Canal, the blackness brought nothing but misery. The Japanese scenting victory were stirring their attack plan, called October 15 X Day, and that was the day the American forces were to be assaulted with enormous force from air, sea, sea and land, that night of October 14th. The howitzers boomed out their deadly messages, and patrols moved along the marine perimeter seeking weak spots. Midnight came, but not quiet then. At two o'clock on the morning of October 15th, the cruisers Chokai and Kinugasa arrived on station a few hundred yards off Guad Canal and began firing their eight-in guns at the airfield. They fired 750 shells at the field, and under that cover the Japanese transports began unloading their 4,000 troops and more big guns, tanks and ammunition. Dawn came and with it the sight of the Japanese calmly unloading their transports while the Americans could do nothing to stop them, and an umbrella of Zero fighters circled overhead. They did not bother to strafe Henderson Field, because Admiral Kurita was sure that he had finally destroyed American Aero on Guad Canal.
he was very nearly right, and before the dawn, General Giger counted airplanes, and he had three dive bombers that could still fly. Two of them were filled with gasoline drained from wrecked planes, and one started to taxi up to the head of the cow pasture. No one noticed the crater in the taxi strip, and the dive bomber rolled into it, smashed under carriage and wing, and was still the other plane got to the end of the runway, turned, and Pilot Lieutenant Robert Patterson pulled back the throttle and began moving with increasing speed along the ground. But then a wheel caught in an eight-inch shell hole made by one of the guns of those cruisers, and the plane slewed around into a ground loop which wrecked it. Beyond repair, Lieutenant Patterson begged to take up the last remaining SBD and did manage to take off with a bomb load. Although his hydraulic system was leaking, he made an attack, hit one of the transports and returned safely to the field. The Zeros apparently were so surprised that they paid no attention, but that one SBD on the morning of October 15th represented the striking power of the Cactus Air Force. That morning General Giger was beggar, but not in despair, and this tough, stocky marine officer with the heavy crow's feet that marked many hours of looking into the sun from the air was first a marine, then an officer, and then a pilot he was prepared to fight. As long as there was anything with which to fight his chief of staff, Colonel Lewis Woods had been sent off to Espiritus Santo, where he had been promoted to Brigadier General and given a command of his own. But on this desperate day, someone on the staff recalled that Lewis Woods had cashed some gasoline around the island. By God said General Gurr, find some. So the staff officer went off to find gasoline drums, and Gurr made him take another officer along, so that if one were killed, someone would know the secret of the caches. They found two hundred drums of gasoline on the edge of the marine perimeter, and another one hundred on the beach south of Cucum, where they had been unloaded in an enormous hurry in those first days when the transports sat off the beach, they found other caches, and by noon General Gurr had a two-day supply of aviation gasoline, and life was not quite so desperate as it had been for General Geyer had been an extremely worried man for the past ten days. Much later General Woods returned to Guadcanal on a visit, and found that Gurr was still carrying around a letter he had written about the gasoline caches unopened, for the moment the gasoline problem was solved. But what would General Gear's pilots fly that morning? The mechanics managed to paste together five F-4Fs, which strafed the transports with some Effect-1 pilot shot down a Japanese float plane. Several bombers were patched up well enough to fly, but one at a time, and they went on dangerous single missions that did not prove effective. General Geiger's second aid major, Jack Cram, had brought two torpedoes back to Guadcanal on his last supply mission in the General's personal PBI, but Cram discovered that all of the torpedo planes were wrecked, and that most of the men of the torpedo squadron had gone off to join the Marines on the perimeter, convinced that the Cactus Air Force was finished. The Japanese could raid Henderson Field at will, and General Geyer had neither the planes nor the gasoline to send fighters up. Every time bombers came over the situation was so critical that the order was issued that there would be no scramble unless at least 15 bombers came over. Major Cram had the idea that maybe he could drop the two torpedoes from the PBY with a homemade bomb release, and so near desperation was General Geyer that he agreed to the scheme Cram took the PBY out to attack, accompanied by several dive bombers whose attack diverted attention from the slow amphibian. Miraculously, he managed to put one of the torpedoes into the side of a transport, and although attacked by several zeros, he also managed to bring the bullet back aided, per by back to Henderson Field, and land without crashing. Admiral Fitch did everything he could that day to help Geiger, and he sent a flight of 11 B-7S from Espiritu Santo, and they bombed one transport successfully, the dive bombers set fire to another, which meant that three of the six Japanese transports were in trouble by two o'clock, on the afternoon of October 15th. The Kushu Maru Sasako Maru and Amason Maru were all afire. Admiral Tanaka took stock. He had unloaded all the troops from all the transports, and most of the supplies from the three undamaged transports, the American attacks were becoming more frequent and troublesome. So he decided to move out with his undamaged transports and destroyers, and leave the three burning ships until night at night, he would bring the destroyers back and complete the unloading, so he moved out, and that was the first indication that the Japanese plan to overwhelm Guadalcanal on X-Day had failed, 
As the day drew to a close, the Americans again counted planes, and they had lost three dive bombers, one F-4F and two P-39. S, they had shot down seven zeros. The ponderous PBI had torpedoed a ship, and the dive bombers had set another afire during the afternoon, in spite of Japanese air raids. Three twin-engine Douglas transports each brought in twelve drums of gasoline. It was not much a fighter plane used a third of one of those plane loads on a mission, but it was something and there was something more. Six of those dive bombers from Espiritus Santo appeared fed by the fighter pilots, so the Cactus Air Force was still in operation as night fell. General Geyer had ten SPDs put in operational condition by heroic mechanics, four P-39 S-3P 400 S and a handful of fighters, and the major problem of the moment was still fuel the tug Viro the destroyer. Meredith and one of the big gas barges were still moving slowly towards Guadcanal on October 15th, although the transports with other supplies had turned back. These vessels were spotted by a Japanese search plane that morning, and just before noon two bombers attacked the convoy was just 75 mil from its destination. The captain of the Meredith decided to continue, but a few minutes later he was informed that two Japanese warships were close by. He wanted to reverse course then, but the Viro was damaged and could not keep up. He ordered the crew to board the destroyer and prepared to sink the tug, as he was making ready to fire the torpedo, a flight of 27 planes from the Japanese carrier Zuikaku attacked, and in five minutes sank the Meredith with bombs and torpedoes the Viro and the barge were. Abandoned, although a few men from the Meredith managed to get aboard tug and barge drifted down towards Seok Channel, deserted the men of the Meredith who had survived the attack, took to life rafts, and, and some in the water clung to the rafts, as in the case of all the ships and planes forced down at sea in the Guad Canal area, the men faced an immediate and serious danger of shark attack for over hundreds of years, the Melanesians had disposed of their dead by setting them afloat at sea, and generations of sharks had acquired a taste for human flesh, as with the survivors of the Battle of Savu Island and the Battle of Cape Esperance. The survivors of the Meredith were attacked, and in the end of the 275 men of the Meredith, only 88 survived that night of October 15th. The cruisers Miyoko and Maya visited Guadcanal and poured one, 158 in shells into Henderson Field. That night, morale reached a new low among the Americans on Guadcanal. Vandergrift reported the bad news to Gourley, and the Japanese had brought in. Big guns bigger than anything Vandergrift had with these guns. The Japanese could shell any point on the island, including the airfield. The enemy had control of the sea and was now able to move around day or night and shell at will if this continued said Vandergrift he could not hold out forever. General Geyer had told him that there was no use trying to repair planes if they could not get more gas, and no use trying to fly them if the airfield was going to be shelled so heavily. The only effective airstrikes as of the afternoon of the 15th could be launched from Espirit to Santo that same day at Admiral Fitch, reported that he was sending away from Espirit to Santo all merchant ships except one oiler, he could no longer guarantee their safety with the Japanese combined. Fleet on the move, Admiral Nimitz had some idea of how tough it was in those days, and on October 15th he sent Gurmley a message saying that he had sent Admiral Kincaid south with the Enterprise and several capital ships to help. I realise that this is a difficult phase of our campaign, and I have complete faith that we will come out on top. Nimitz also sent King an urgent message calling for the Joint Chiefs to make available major assistance, but even as he sent it, he knew it would never arrive in time if the battle was to be won. At least the first phase of it must be won with the forces at hand in the South Pacific, and if he could not change troops, he could change commanders at the early October meetings. Nimitz had not been happy with what he saw of Gormley's handiwork, and he had the feeling they ever handed me he was under no illusion about the task ahead, nor was he critical of Admiral Gormley's performance. Technically, Gourley was doing everything that had to be done that could be done, but as Admiral Nimitz knew better than anyone else after that October visit, technical performance was not the highest qualification of a successful battle commander.
Gormley had no confidence in the operation, and consequently no confidence in himself, or in the ability of his subordinate commanders to accomplish the difficult task set them by Admiral King Holly, had the quality of self-confidence he had always had it since the days at the Naval Academy, when he was the most popular man in his class. There was something about Holly that inspired confidence, and if he said it could be done, then men would do it. High took command of the South Pacific on October 18th. The military situation was no better than it had been three days earlier, on October 16th. The destroyer seaplane tender McFarland arrived at Guadcanal carrying 12 torpedoes for the Moriband torpedo bombers, but also crates of 37mm ammunition for General Vandergrift's guns, and above all 40,000 gallons of aviation fuel for Henderson Field. Lieutenant Commander John C. Alderman had not slept well on the voyage over sitting on that explosive keg, and he was no more comfortable at Guadcanal, either the ship anchored off the beach at Longer Point, and began discharging gasoline from the ship's tanks into barge tanks. They were still pumping gas at five o'clock when someone said he saw a submarine. Periscope skipper Alderman decided to move out of the area for the night and headed away with the barge still alongside fifty minutes later. Nine Japanese dive bombers attacked the McFarland, giving Alderman and the crew a terrible fight. The gunners shot down one dive bomber and damaged a second, but the planes blew up the gasoline barge and put a bomb into the ship. Luckily, at the fan tail, where the depth charge racks were located, the bomb blew up. Holly enters. Several depth charges blew off the rudder, damaged the engines, and threw a cargo of hospital patients into a panic. These were ambulatory patients, men who were suffering from what was once called shell shock or battle fatigue, and they scared easily and they very nearly disrupted Ed the crew's efforts to save the ship, but Alderman and his men somehow brought them under control and managed to coax the damaged vessel across the channel into Tulagi Harbour, pulled at the end by a tow, and saving that precious aviation gasoline in the tender several times each day the marines at Henderson. Field welcomed the R4D transport planes that shuttled as quickly as possible between Guadcanal and Espiritus Santo, bringing precious drums of aviation gas. The submarine Amberjack was loaded with 9,000 gallons of gasoline and 10 tonnes of aerial bombs, and made the voyage necessity was obviously the mother of invention. If some of the high command seemed to have given up, the same could not be said of the troops on October 16th and 17. The Japanese on Guadalcanal were very quiet. General Huat Take's reinforcements continued to arrive night after night in groups of about 1,000, although the general was troubled by the beaching of those transports that never could be completely unloaded, and although the bombardment of the Kokumbona area destroyed enough supplies to give him concern, he was busy with his planning. Since the timing for the full-scale attack had been thrown off, X-Day had been allowed to pass and was supplanted by W-Day. General Huake could not ask for more seasoned troops than he had in general. Maruyama's 2nd or Sendai Division from northern Honu? This division had fought in China and was famous in Japan and infamous in the rest of the world world for its Nanjing massacre. General Giger and Admiral Fitch combined forces with Admiral Murray to try to squelch the Japanese land build-up on October 16th. Geiger sent his ten operable dive bombers against targets on the island. He also sent the seven army planes, which were more useful for striking ground targets than for any other purpose. The Cactus Air Force flew seven ground attack missions that day, with a loss of one SBD. The Hornets planes spent most of the day over the island, striking at troop concentrations and supply dumps late in the afternoon, as the McFarland had unloaded 20,000 gallons of her gasoline and was being attacked. The dozen fighters of Marine Fighter Squadron 212 flew into Guadcanal to reinforce Henderson Field Squadron Commander Joe Bauer, saw the Japanese dive bombers attacking the destroyer, went after them, and shot down four of them in a few moments before landing at Henderson on the night of October 16th. Pearl Harbor's radio intelligence team intercepted messages indicating that planes from the Japanese carriers Hayo and Jun had been flown into Tabua and would attack Guad Canal on the morning of October 17th. So early that day, the F-4Fs of Henderson Field were in the air, and at 7.30am, the Japanese came over 18 dive bombers and 18 Zeros,
the Americans shot down six bombers and four zeros, while losing one fighter that night of October 17th, Admiral Yamamoto sent the Tokyo Express. Down the slot once again, three cruisers and eight destroyers anchored off Tassafaronga, and another five destroyers anchored off Cape Esperance. Several of them shelled the American positions, including the fighter strip, which they seemed finally to have discovered as a separate entity. The shelling kept the American planes from taking to the air, while several of the Japanese destroyers landed more thousands of troops Admiral Yamamoto had grown more than a little impatient with the army when General Hotake indicated that he was not quite sure when the big land offensive would take place. The combined fleet had sailed and the men expected to fight, but instead, after October 11th, they were milling around north of the Solomons, waiting for word from the army. Finally, Yamamoto had called off X Day and was now awaiting General Hyuk Kake's indication of the date on which he would be prepared to take Henderson Field Yukutake was so pleased with the Navy performance on the night of October 17th that he made the decision why a Y day would be October 20th. On October 17, the Marines were given a hand by the Navy when the destroyers Aaron Ward and Mallow moved in west of Simona in one of the Japanese sectors of the island, and they did to the enemy what the Japanese destroyers, cruisers and battleships had been doing to the Marines. The two destroyers fired 2,000 rounds of five in ammunition at Japanese supply dumps and destroyed large quantities of enemy ammunition and food. General H. Cat had not yet assessed the damage done by the raid, begun by destroyers Aaron Ward and Ma'ala and augmented by the Cactus Air Force and Hornet planes. The big loss was in transport trucks and armoured vehicles, and their fuel supplies had been blown sky-high so many of them that Major General Tadashi Sumiyoshi, commander of the 17th Army Artillery, was very much concerned that same day, October 17th, Admiral Nimitz showed how much he was trying to help. He was at last ordering the diversion of some Pacific Fleet submarines to the Guadalcanal area. He also had suggestions the Japanese combined fleet was dependent on a small number of fleet tankers, and if Admiral Fitch and General MacArthur could send planes after those tankers, it might relieve the pressure Nimitz was getting a new task group of ships built around the new battleship Indiana, and he sent that straight from the Atlantic through the Panama Canal to the South Pacific. The 25th Army Infantry Division on Oahu was ordered to move south from the Army. Nimitz got fighter planes and B-17 bombers to augment Fitz's slender forces. They were coming as fast. As they could in this hour of crisis, even General MacArthur seemed to rouse himself from his policy of minimal cooperation. He had resisted employment of the Brisbane-based submarines for tactical purposes at Guadcanal, but now he would send them all that Holly had to do was hold out until the help arrived. Holly did not need much of Admiral Gormley's time and no more of his advice. He had brought some staff and he brought in more of his own men, not to denigrate Gawley, but because his own staff knew his ways and they had not been contaminated by defeatism. The flagship was the old destroyer tender Aron, but Hai moved into the former Japanese consulate and set up his headquarters on October 18th. The word began to move through the fleet and to Guadcanal Holly had come the morale on the island, never apparently as low as that back at headquarters received a sudden boost. Holly was one commander that every marine and sailor could respect for, he was aggressive and outspoken in his intent to win the war. Kill, Japs, kill, Japs, kill, more Japs was his slogan, and within a matter of hours it had been painted and hung up all over the command from the walls of Numia to the fleet landing at T2. So the morale of the Americans, most of whom did not know the critical situation, went up, but the morale of those who did know the problems and the deadly nature of the threat posed by Admiral Yamamoto was another matter one that would not respond to a gesture High took command on October 18th, and that day he had an inkling of the possible future. Admiral Kusaka sent 15 more Bettys and 9 Zer to Guadcanal on the noon raid, the augmented Cactus Air Force, with enough gasoline for a change, shot down three bombers and four fighters with the loss of one F-4F, but the Japanese army was now causing trouble at Henderson, firing with the 150mm howitzers and other artillery on both runways, so that even the fighter strip was not usable. Most of that day, General Giger ordered the engineers to begin construction of another airfield east. Out of the range, he thought of the Japanese guns, 
West of the Matano River, the next day, Guadcanal was still quiet, but it was the ominous quiet of preparation on the ground. General Soshi's attack force was cutting its way through the jungle from the supply area at Kokona toward the positions from which it would launch the attack on Henderson Field on the night of October 20th, having lost some of his heavy equipment on the 17th. General Sumiyoshi was finding the Guadalcanal jungle the hardest terrain his men had ever encountered, but they pressed on day and night.